Peter Jackson's King Kong, the official game of the movie, is the best damn video game based off a movie ever, and I will V-Rex jaw snap you and your family if you disagree with me. Okay, I'm sorry for being so aggressive. Are we cool? I'm just very passionate about this 2005 movie video game that has an absurdly long title. And with good reason. Video game movies are... Well, they're not good, okay? Crap Woman, sorry, I mean Cat Woman. Awful game, awful movie. Superman 64, one of the worst games of all time. Michael Jackson's Moonwalker, Jaws, Back to the Future, Transformers, Spider-Man 3, Monster Zing, all awful. The E.T. game was so bad, it literally crashed the gaming industry and it didn't recover for over 10 years. This game was so bad, they buried the unsold copies in a desert in New Mexico. And I know this well, I played most of these growing up as a stupid kid, grinning and drooling just because I had a new video game to play, not really caring about quality. So when I played King Kong back in 2005, it stuck with me because it felt different. And not just because you got to punch the shit out of dinosaurs. I didn't know what it was back then because I was just a kid. But with the benefit of hindsight, it felt different because compared to its peers in the video game based off a movie category, it was actually really good. At a very high level, the gameplay was engaging, the world was immersive, the characters were believable, albeit loud and they can't take care of themselves. But I'm getting ahead of myself. What credibility do I have to tell you this is a good game? Well, I'll have you know my last review video got over 250 views, so I'm a pretty big deal. I have 1000 gamer score in King Kong, so you know I'm a goddamn pro gamer. And I have this little orangutan toy, so you know I love primates. That's the three reasons I can tell you about the game with the monkey, alright? Let's go. Peter Jackson, for you Neanderthalic collections of cells that don't know him, is the director, writer and producer of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, which were pretty good, don't know if you've heard of them. He's also the third best thing to come out of New Zealand, behind the All Blacks rugby team and these cute little bird things called Kiwis. Look at them, they're adorable! Immediately after the wildly successful trilogy was released, Jackson started work on King Kong the movie. It's not exactly clear who instigated the idea, but the idea of a video game adaptation of the movie was floated around and Jackson wanted a visionary studio to make something that was going to complement and deepen the King Kong experience and not just be a shameless cash grab. One such developer in the mix was Ubisoft Montpellier, headed up by French game designer Michel Ancel, the creator of the critically and commercially successful Rayman series, as well as the 2003 critical success but without the sales to show for it, Beyond Good and Evil. Jackson was a big fan of Beyond Good and Evil and appreciated the vision that Ancel showed, leading to Ancel and Ubisoft Montpellier heading up the development for the video game adaptation for King Kong. Ancel did what the French do best, smoked a cigarette and got to work. King Kong the game was going to be a big collaboration project between the two studios, Ubisoft Montpellier and Jackson's movie production company Wingnut Films. The extent of involvement that Wingnut had in the development process of the game is pretty well known. They shared the original assets of the film, including clips, sounds, likeness, and voice for the characters, among a whole heap of concept art. Jackson was also in constant contact with Ansel, where ideas for the progress and direction of the game would be shaped. The whole idea of this was to make a game that will complement the film and to make a new experience that wasn't just a direct copy of the movie, but a whole new adventure based on the film that would absorb you into Skull Island and the dangers it poses just as much as the film. In the game, King Kong, the official game of the movie, based on the movie, King Kong, you play as this guy. Okay, so the plot of the game follows the plot of the movie. You go to the obviously safe and friendly island named Skull Island to film a movie on location. You get stranded on the island in a storm and have to survive the perils of nature, which includes giant millipedes, crabs, raptors, and holy shit! There's evidence all over the island that you're not alone. Crudely fashioned spears, monuments carved into stone, you get the idea. Eventually, you encounter the island natives who kidnap the film's leading lady, Anne, and sacrifice her to the real ruler of the island, Kong. The rest of the game, you try to rescue Anne and escape Skull Island before either succumbing to the wildlife or the treacherous terrain of the island itself. And of course, you do get to play as Kong, keeping Anne safe from the wildlife. Jeez, this girl really can't catch a break. The game is a first-person survival shooter, with the majority of the game played from the first-person viewpoint of Jack Driscoll, aka this guy from earlier. This viewpoint is only broken when you play as Kong, when the game becomes a third-person fighting game. As Jack, you hoof it through the jungles and ruins of Skull Island, taking on the native animals. You have access to firearms in the game, but these are spread out, so quite often you'll find yourself without a weapon. What's this? A first-person shooter game without guns? How can this be a good game? Okay, okay, don't get ahead of yourself. 
This is a survival game, right? So giving you unlimited access to guns is a big no-no. Instead, about half the time you'll find yourself using spears, either appropriating spears from the natives you find around the environment, or taking one from a very generous pile of bones. Thank you, Mr. Bones. A good little touch for added depth here is that the spears made by the natives actually do more damage than the bone spears, which, you know, makes sense. Of course they would. These spears are purposely designed to fight and kill. In real life, this would be more dangerous than a sharp piece of bone you found, no doubt. Just don't get too excited when you find one, because also like real life, they break after so many uses. The combination of sparingly placed ammunition and limited supply of actual spears will have you really thinking about how you approach every fight. If you use your ammo on weaker enemies like crabs or millipedes, you'll find yourself trying to fight off raptors with spears, which trust me, ends up like this most of the time. So instead you'll go and find a spear, but then you'll wonder, should I use the real spear or the bone spear and save the actual spear for an upcoming dinosaur? For a game from 2005 with literally three items to choose from, a spear, a bone or a gun, the amount of resource management you end up doing is insane. And that's before you end up in situations where you have a gun, say a shotgun, and then you come across a rifle. Because then you have to decide, am I going to keep the shotgun? Do I grab the rifle? Because you can only carry one spear and one gun at a time, so you better hope you chose the right weapons for the situation. Also, you've probably noticed from the footage already, but there's no heads up display. This isn't some cinematic mode in the main menu, this is the default setting for the game. If you want to know how many bullets you have left in your gun, you press a button on the controller and Jack will tell you. Nice shot. Two magazines on backup. Also, if this isn't your thing, you can just turn it off in the options to keep the game accessible for those who just want to shoot some dinosaurs. All of this is designed with the sole purpose of keeping your mind in the world of Skull Island and to keep you on edge. It's almost a complete contrast to games like Resident Evil 4, where you have a wealth of info on the screen at all times, and a full inventory to manage. Despite the completely different approaches, both games have you nervous about your loadout in the same way, wondering if you've got it right, despite King Kong giving you such a limited inventory to survive with, in comparison. Each fight you have, no matter the enemy, be it a few oversized bugs, or a full-blown pack of flying monkeys, will leave a bitter taste in your mouth. Yeah, you won, you survive, but at what cost? Now you've got two bullets left, congrats. With this said, the game is never unfair. Weapons are spaced almost perfectly, so you will at least have something which can get you through the next fight, and give you a reason to keep playing. That dopamine rush after fighting off some raptors and you turn the corner to find a crate of ammo is addictive, man. You won't find a rush like this from your local purveyor of imported goods in the alley behind Domino's Pizza. And that's pretty much the gameplay. It's not too much more nuanced than that. There is a few platforming segments, such as crossing a chasm over a rickety bridge, and a few puzzles which mostly involve finding a makeshift lever to open a door locked by the natives. And that's fine because the game isn't an adventure platformer or a puzzle game. It puts survival at the core of the game and narrative and doesn't do too much to draw you out of it. Speaking of survival, everyone always says in real life there's a few things you need in a survival situation. Food, water, and... FIRE! OH FIRE! OH MY GOODNESS! Fire plays such a critical role in progressing through the game, mirroring its importance in a real life survival situation. You don't use it to cook or sterilise things though, because, you know, real life survival is really boring. Instead you use it to burn dead bushes blocking your path to progress, or in combat, use it to block dinosaurs from reaching you with a fiery wall of death. I mean hell, even just knock a torch down and burn anything and everything around like some goddamn angel of death. It's awesome to feel in control and powerful in the game like this, the few times it happens. The developers have really perfected making you feel smart for outsmarting a glorified gecko. I want to talk about the game world itself, alright? Because it's pretty friggin' important. You end up stranded on Skull Island, and it's quite an apt name, because, you know, death. The design of the island itself is really cool, with a lot of different environments for you to trudge through, besides just jungle, jungle, and, oh look, more jungle. From the dark, cold and stony beaches where you wash up, swampy forests of stones and reeds, cliff top walks, you don't want to fall down there, trust me, not good for you. Mountainous canyons, ravines, ominous ruins, Look, the point is, for a game set on a single island, there's enough here to be interesting. And that's before I've even mentioned the wildlife. You may remember that I spent about 10 minutes fangirling over the fighting in this game. Sound familiar? But that's not what I want to say. The game world has a habit of feeling alive, and by this giving you a more in-depth survival experience, because you feel like you can use the world against itself. Whether that's spearing a bug on a stick and using it as bait to attract some dinos, so you can sneak past them, or just watching them all fight each other from a safe distance. Irrespective of what you, the player, are doing, the world feels like it carries on without you, and this is core to the experience. 
In terms of pacing, the game is pretty fluid, despite being a series of levels set apart by loading screens. This is more of a technical limitation, because very rarely will you start a level and not be exactly where you left the previous level. For pacing in the story, this is fantastic. The whole game takes place over the course of like, two days, and you're in an emergency, you gotta save Anne and get off the island. By keeping the story linear, and not breaking this, save for loading screens, this sense of urgency continues, and the game's day and night cycle follows this, keeping in rhythm with the pacing of the story. You'll notice, the sun only rises once or twice throughout the entire game. Speaking of pacing, the level design is very linear for this reason, with few exceptions. By keeping you on track, you don't wander off to explore and inadvertently break the sense of emergency and tension that's been building. That's a problem a lot of open world games have. You'll have this mission where the world depends on you. The fate of the world rests in your hands. Oh, sorry guys, I gotta mine some rocks and make some daggers. I can't fight the Reapers and save the galaxy without cutting some shapes in the club with Doran first. Saving the world can wait. I need to get some of this sweet, sweet alien... That's not what this game is about. I like games where you can explore too. Skyrim's good, Mass Effect is good, but I appreciate having a self-contained story just as much. The developers have done well to push you down this path and always keep a lingering sense of anxiety in your mind. At no point do you ever really feel safe. Anxiety, unsafety, just like real life. A dinosaur, or bat monkey thing, can come from anywhere. Everything I've talked about really comes to a zenith at the Brontosaurus Highway, which I think is the best part of the game. Pulling together neatly the desperation for resources to fight, while sending raptors after you constantly, while you can't fight back due to either needing to carry a flaming torch or because you're bogged down in some swamp water, all while avoiding a massive herd of brontosaurus running from something. All you need to know is that if something this big is running from something, you need to get the hell out of there. It will be an unpopular opinion, but this part of the game is some of the most compelling gameplay you'll ever experience in a video game, let alone a game based off a friggin' monkey movie. You get separated from your group, which is already anxiety inducing because they're really helpful at fighting enemies. You're at a massive disadvantage when you have to go it alone. To progress, you have to find fire and use a stick to bring it back to your group, which puts you at an even bigger disadvantage because if you're carrying fire, you can't fight anything without throwing away the thing you need first. So you throw it, shoot whatever's after you, then have to backtrack and start again. All the while, obstacles take you on a longer path. Burning bushes prevents you from making progress while raptors constantly are after you, and you have to dodge a stampede of brontosaurus, trampling everything, you and the raptors included. To make matters worse, you're running towards whatever the brontosaurus are running from, which, as you might guess, isn't very friendly. I can't describe how fun and intense this section is, it perfectly pulls together everything this game is about. Survival on an island that doesn't care about anything, its own wildlife, or you. Everything is prey. Except for one thing. Okay, so I may have lied a little earlier. While the game is mostly continuous from Jack's point of view, occasionally the game gets broken up by segments where, of course, you play as Kong. But these sections are largely forgettable. I understand why they're here. First of all, Playing a game called King Kong based on a movie called King Kong and then only having like two minutes of screen time for King Kong would be pretty dumb. So you get some playable sections too. Second of all, playing as Drac is stressful. I've hammered that point to death. More death than you'll experience playing the game. Playing as Kong puts you in the complete opposite frame of mind. Kong is powerful. He's the strongest being on the island. No longer is the island a major threat to you. You can use the terrain to navigate wherever you want. And even the biggest, baddest monster on the island the V-Rex, which you have no hope of fighting and spend the game running away from as Jack, is nothing compared to Kong, since you completely wreck like 6 or 7 during the game, and even 2 at once. Those raptors you spend the game running from, just friggin' punch them across the island! It's obvious that this was to give you a break, make you feel powerful and unstoppable compared to how vulnerable you feel playing as Jack. These sections, as I've mentioned, are mostly linear platforming segments, with a few fights in between, and honestly, they're mostly boring save from absolutely jaw-snapping or body-slamming the most terrifying lizard to ever walk the planet. The pacing that has had so much work put into it playing as Jack is kind of broken by playing as Kong. But these sections are short, and just enough to drive the subtext of the game. What if... Humans are the bad guys? As Kong, all you try to do is save Anne and get to Kong's lair. As Jack, all you try to do is, uh save Anne and uh, get to Kong's lair? Okay, you both have the same objective, maybe we're not so different after all. With this in mind, you know that the story will intertwine at some point and this merger of the two narratives drives you along. 
You want Kak and Jong, sorry, Jack and Kong to meet. You want to see what happens when they do. Man versus beast, beast versus man, man versus food. Ultimately, the dichotomy of man and beast is at the core of the game. Jack spends the game fighting, killing almost every creature he comes across. Kong, beast, whatever you want to label him, spends the game just trying to protect Anne. Sure, he does it by kicking ass, but so does our boy Jack. Who's the real animal here? Ultimately, you know where this is going, because spoilers for a story that's 89 years old, you know Kong gets taken from his home, where he's the ruler, to beautiful New York City. The city section of the game, like the other Kong levels, is again, kind of boring. Running through the streets and beating on police cars, eventually climbing the Empire State Building. The who is the real animal trope really kicks in here. Kong, the king of Skull Island, hangs atop the pinnacle of humanity's achievement and surveys the kingdom which doesn't belong to him. Knocking planes out of the sky at this point feels great. You know that Kong doesn't belong here, and as the player, you want to win. It is a game after all. Ultimately though, this is a game no one wins. In an almost perverse, mocking parody of classic fantasy tales of heroes and monsters, the hero, wounded gravely from his final battle, reaches out helplessly and falls. The way this final section is designed is perfect. This easily could have been a cutscene, but they specifically chose not to do this, and it perfectly rounds out the journey we've been on for the last seven-ish hours. The gameplay is simple, but it's great. It's just a means to an end at this point. The fact that you can punch these planes out the sky is so damn satisfying. It's kind of like the final level of Halo Reach, Lone Wolf. You know you're going out, but if you gotta go out... Send me out. Because this is a video game, you can unlock galleries that you can walk through which are really cool. Games don't do stuff like this anymore. And in a move that's genius, you can unlock an alternative ending where you shoot down the planes attacking Kong, he climbs down and you return him to Skull Island. You know what, as far as I'm concerned, this is the real ending because the other one is too damn sad. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why King Kong, the official game of the movie, is the best damn video game based off a movie ever. So I'm gonna level with you. You want this secret ending where Kong survives, right? Well, the only way to get it is to subscribe to my channel and like the video. Do that, and I will send the hidden ending to you in the post on not one, not two, but three floppy disks. It's that easy. Thanks for watching, and if you like that, you might like this. I think it's a good video. Not because I made it or anything, I just think it's pretty good. Is anyone still there?